pushing with us this morning as we sing this song. in our lives we were prisoners to sin but because of Jesus Christ we are now running free let's believe that sing it out with your hearts with ours here we go because we were the beggars and now we're royalty we were the prisoners and now we're running free because we are forgiven accepted redeemed by his grace let the house of the Lord sing. You're the house of the Lord, sing it out. We were. We were the beggars, now the royalty. Cause we were the prisoners, now we're running free. Cause we are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing. house of the Lord today and we won't be quiet we shout out your praise let's join the house of the Lord how God is sure be in this place come on church shout out Destroy the house of the Lord. How God 
So we're going to continue in worship, singing a song that says, I ran out of that grave. And I think it's worth explaining maybe a little bit while we're doing that. It seems weird for a worship song, at least to me. Um, the, the thing is with sin that we have, it just is not ugly. It's not just a problem. It just doesn't make us bad. Uh, it just makes us dead. You know, we were dead in our trespasses and we fall short. So this song comes right out of John chapter 11. And we see Jesus raising a dead man and bringing him to life. And Jesus cries out to him. He says, Lazarus, come out. And I really believe, and he says, he's saying the same thing to you and really to me. That's why we're singing this song this week. I carry this week uh, with me. He says, Eliel, come out. I believe he's saying to you today, come out through Village Church. Come out. He knows your name. He knows your story. He knows where you're coming from. He loves you all the same. And he's telling you, just get out of that grave and be done with it. All those grave clothes of sin and shame are done. We've been set free. And it's because, and we've been raised to glorious life because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So all of those chains of your past, all the worries about the future are done. Scripture tells us the very same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is living in each of us who follow Jesus. And I believe that it is a reality for us this morning as we sing. So before we sing Glorious Day, I invite you to pray with us. Jesus, because of you, I know, we know, we have a future. Our eyes are open. Jesus, I thank you for calling my name. I believe chains break at the weight of your glory. And I ask you, Lord, to help me remember who you are, whose I am, and help us to live a life that brings you glory. In your name we pray this. Amen. Thank you. 
need a rescue my head was heavy but chains break out the weight of your glory i needed shelter i was an orphan now you call me a citizen of heaven when i was broken you were my healing now your love Let's turn and greet each other in the name of the Lord. If you find someone you don't know, please introduce yourself. transition to a quieter song we invite you to just take a few moments now to just consider like a, the one glimpse we have of heaven and we see it out of the uh, revelation chapter 4 where all the saints and all the angels together come together and declaring holy 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 and we get to do that this morning together generations falling down in worship to sing a song of ages to the Lamb to all who've gone before us and all who will believe we'll sing a song of ages to the Lamb sing your name is your name is the highest your name is the greatest your name stands above them all all thrones and dominions all powers and positions your name stands above them all and the
Your name is the highest. Your name is the greatest. Your name stands above them all. All thrones and dominions. All thrones and dominions. All powers and positions. Your name stands above them all. Say that again. Your name. highest your name is the greatest your name stands above them all thrones all thrones and positions all powers and positions your name stands above them all and the angels cry still echoes in our hearts. You who were and are and are to come. From generation to generation, your holiness remains unchanged. Before there were elections or nations, before there was time itself, you were holy. And when all earthly kingdoms have passed away, you will still be holy. We stand in awe, Father, that you invite us into your presence. Though we are dust, though our days pass like grass, you crown us with loving kindness and tender mercies. In this season of change in our nation, we anchor ourselves in your unchanging character. The morning stars sang together at creation, and still today we join their eternal song Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. As Thanksgiving approaches, we remember that every perfect gift comes from you, the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. Thank you for the freedom to worship, for the privilege of participating in our democracy, and for your sovereign hand that has guided our nation through every season of change. We do lift up our leaders, Lord, both newly elected and continuing in office. May they govern with wisdom that flows from your holy character, pursuing justice, loving mercy, and walking humbly with you. Unite our divided land under your banner of love. Lord, even as we celebrate your transcendent holiness, we bring our earthly needs before you. For those in our congregation carrying burdens of illness, grief, or anxiety, 
be their strong tower. For those facing financial strain as the holidays approach, be their provider. And for those wrestling with the election's outcome, please be their peace. As we prepare our hearts and homes for Thanksgiving, let gratitude overflow. We praise you not just for what you do, but for who you are, holy, righteous, faithful, and true. May the knowledge of your holiness transform how we live and love in this world. You alone are holy. You alone are Lord. You alone are worthy of all glory, honor, and praise forever and ever. Through Jesus Christ, who makes us holy through his blood. Amen. Please be seated. Uh, my name is Mark Talamini. I'm privileged to be serving with the worship team this weekend. Again, we're just absolutely delighted to have you with us this morning. And for those who are online, great to have you as well. If you are a first-time visitor, we would love to give you a gift. Uh, there is a water bottle at the welcome counter down the steps that we would love to give you as a token of our appreciation that you're here with us this morning. Unfortunately, if you're online, we can't get the water bottle to you. But if you're new and online, there is a I'm new button in the upper right corner of the website. We would love for you to click that and fill out what comes up. If you're in the sanctuary and you're new, or if you have a need that you'd like to express to us, there are cards in the pew in front of you. Please feel free to fill those out and then put them, uh, give them to one of the ushers uh, on the way out. One of the ways we worship here at Three Village Church is with our tithes and offerings. There are multiple ways to do that. One are the blue envelopes, again, in the pews in front of you. You can put a check or cash in there, and there's a box on the left down the stairs. Or you can go online and click the Give button, and there are multiple ways that you can uh, do so there. And now please listen to the reading of the word. Today's scripture reading comes from Romans 11. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him, are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. My name is Josh Moody. I'm the lead pastor here. Um, my wife is chuckling because I just put out the reading glasses that I finally broke down and bought a couple of weeks ago. I, it was at the congregational meeting. I was trying to read from my favorite Bible that's very small print, and I couldn't do it. So instead of getting the larger print, got these. Uh, still figuring out when to put them on and when to take them off, so bear with me there. But uh, long before I needed reading glasses, I, I had an experience uh, it was actually the time that I learned I was afraid of heights. Some of you have heard me talk about this before. Uh, the summer I graduated from college, my dad planned a backpacking trip for my younger brother and me where we went out to Wyoming to the Grand Teton Mountains uh, for about a week of hiking and camping and backpacking. And uh, one of the places that my dad took us to, if I had known where we were going, I would have said, uh-uh, not going there because the place was called Death Canyon. Think about it. What, what good can happen in Death? Why do you think they named it that, Dad? Death Canyon. So we go and we set up base camp in Death Canyon, sleep the night, and then the next morning we're going to do a day hike, leave our stuff set up, hike up to the peak, uh, a peak called Static Peak, elevation 11,200 feet, give or take a few. 
Uh, it's about a four-mile hike up and four miles down, 3,000-foot elevation change, so pretty strenuous hike. We set out in the morning, hiked for a few hours up, and we're getting to where the summit is now in view. We're not there, but you can start to see it. Uh, and the only thing standing in the way of getting to the summit is we have to, to, to walk down a stretch of the trail known as Static Peak Divide. Now, that is a ridge that's razor thin. The path is about four feet wide, and on either side, there's a drop of about 1,000 feet. So you miss a step, you slip on a rock, well, you know why they call it Death Canyon, okay? <laughs> and I remember, I can't remember how long, in my mind, it's gotten, it's gotten to be a mile long. It wasn't that long, but I remember it was, it was absolutely terrifying. My dad's in the lead, and my brother, and I'm, and I'm bringing up the rear, and I'm already exhausted from this much hiking, you know, going up a lot. The air is thin. I'm getting lightheaded. I'm like, I don't think this is worth it. And I remember we had to go, uh, the, the, the ridge took us to a little bend in the trail. And at the bend in the trail, there were some really big boulders before we went through another stretch of uh, static peak divide and then scrambled up to the summit. I remember we came to those boulders and we sat down for a break. We actually captured a picture of this moment uh, right here. That's me on the far right. Uh, my dad there looking like he's about to go off the edge. Uh, what you can't see is my left hand that's desperately clinging to a rock around the bend there. <laughs> I remember as we sat there, we had a drink of water. I said, you know, guys, isn't it beautiful right here? I mean, just look at the view, you know? We don't really have to go to the summit, do we? We could just have our picnic lunch right here, enjoy the view, call it a day, and head back down. And I thought they would be compassionate, you know, realize what's going on. Not a chance. They looked at each other. They looked back at me. They said, all right, you stay here. We'll catch you on the way back down. They had hit the only button that would make me keep going, and that was my ego button. You know, I wouldn't be outdone. So we got up and went across a bit more of this treacherous ridge and then scrambled up some rocks to the summit. You know what? It was worth it. It was worth the danger and the risk and the effort because once we got to the peak, there was a 360-degree view all around. The air was fresh and clean like nothing you would breathe lower. Uh, we could see for hundreds and hundreds of miles uh, mountains, streams, lakes, valleys, just an amazing... It, it was one of those moments where you don't want it to end, especially because you have to go back across Static Peak Divide to get back down. But it was all worth it. And I share that today because I have a hunch that some of you, when you think about the things we do to get to know God, uh, reading the Bible, trying to understand it, uh, coming to church, sitting through sermons, studying tough passages of Scripture, I think some of you feel like it is treacherous hiking. It's, it's like there's this razor-thin edge, and you're like, I, I don't understand this. I don't know if I'm ever going to understand this. I don't know if I'm ever going to get the benefit of, of knowing God. If I do get there, is it going to be worth all that I've had to go through to get there? And that sense is something that I think is captured in the scripture passage that we're looking at today. Paul is the writer who wrote the book of Romans. We've been looking at it's really a letter uh, to, to followers of Jesus in the city of Rome. Uh, we've been looking at chapters 9 through 11, but the whole first part of the book, chapters 1 through 11, Paul has been like on this strenuous hike, wading through some dense forest, if you will, to try to unpack important theological principles, like explaining why we so desperately need a Savior, and explaining how, how Jesus accomplished our salvation, what that means, and how we receive that gift. And he got to chapter 9 and 10 and 11, where we've been looking at for these last few weeks of our series. And he really went into some deep stuff. He talked about this question of the, the Jewish rejection of Jesus. And now in these final verses of chapter 11, he's, he's emerging from this grueling hike, this dense forest or this strenuous ridge, if I can mix my metaphors, and he's coming out to the summit or he's coming to an open field where the air is fresh and sweet and he just falls down to bask in God's presence, just overflowing with worship. And what he shows us here, I think, is the life-changing impact of knowing God. So that's what we're going to see today, and I'm going to try to structure this so you can keep up. Uh, we're going to see three things, I hope. One, a preview of the summit. 
Two, a reason to keep pushing forward. And three, a new perspective from the top. A preview of the summit, a reason to keep pushing forward, and a new perspective from the top. You're going to have a Bible open as we go through this. We'll be in the end of Romans chapter 11. Uh, If you don't have your own Bible, we do have some under the chairs in front of you. You're welcome to take one of those. And we'll start on page 1615 in that version. If you're trying to use your Bible app and your own Wi-Fi, you might want to switch off and go to just your cell service because I'm told the Wi-Fi has been acting up today. So if you're not able to access, you might need to do that. By the way, the Wi-Fi we're discovering, you guys have been around, we've had some thermostat issues. It was, the room was 61 degrees when we walked in today. Uh, and when we kicked on, a, we tried something else with a different thermostat and it kicked on and started pumping heat. The Wi-Fi went out. And so... We're thinking there's a power connection in there, so it's all probably related to what's been going on with the live stream, so we appreciate your patience as we wade through that forest. Uh, All right, a lot of mixed metaphors. All right, as is always the case, we have to recall the context of what we've been looking at so that we understand fully what we're studying today. Uh, Remember, in chapter 9, Paul started out with this intense emotional pain over the fact that his Jewish brothers and sisters have rejected Jesus largely as their savior. He's wrestling with the question that scholars call the problem of Jewish unbelief. This perplexing fact that the people who should have been most ready to embrace Jesus instead largely rejected him. That took Paul to the primary explanation for that fact, the end of chapter 9, beginning of chapter 10, which was that the Jewish people largely sought to make themselves right with God by their effort, putting together a resume for God instead of simply accepting the gift of righteousness that he offers through faith in Jesus. And then we saw along the way that God in his mysterious wisdom opens the hearts of some people to receive his offer while hardening the hearts of others who refuse his offer. Mystery. And then we saw in chapter 10 that in order for anyone to believe in Jesus, they have to first hear the good news. Somebody has to be a messenger and tell them about what Jesus has done. People like us, we're the messengers. And then last week, Pastor Andy showed us in the first part of chapter 11 that Jesus was the insider who holds the door open for outsiders. In other words, he came as a savior to the Jewish people but also made it possible for non-Jews, like most of us, to become part of God's family and recipients of God's promises. That's where our series title comes from, grafted. It's like being grafted into a plant where most of us are not Jewish, but we've been grafted into God's family through Jesus. And then we saw that part of the intended effect of that, part of what God wanted to happen, was that Jewish people would see what we found in Jesus and have what you might call a holy envy. They might want it too, and so come back and reconsider Jesus themselves. Wow, that's a lot of dense for us we, we went through, right? I mean, some real trudging through theological heavy mysteries. Some of you are going, isn't it Advent yet? Like, you know, Mary, angels, manger, can't we? Next week, we're going there, okay? Keep your boots on because we got some hiking to do today. Now, there's a verse at the end of Andy's passage last week that he didn't have time to to really address that we need to explore a little bit before we conclude the chapter. This is what I'm calling a preview of the summit. It's in verses 25 and 26. Paul says, I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. Now skip down to verse 30. Just as you who were at one time disobedient to God have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, so they too have now become disobedient in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. For God has bound everyone over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. Now, that is a head-scratcher, isn't it? This is actually a moment of great hope for Paul. He started this section practically in tears for his people, and now he says, 
all Israel will be saved, verse 26. And there's a lot of debate over what that verse means. There's not a lot of agreement. Some people think maybe Paul is saying every ethnic Jewish person will ultimately experience salvation regardless of how they respond to Jesus. I don't think that's the case because Paul has already, as we've seen, made a distinction between ethnic Israel, people who have Jewish lineage, and spiritual Israel, people who who believe God's promises. Paul has also said, if it were possible to become right with God in any other way, Jesus would not have died. That would have been a waste. And so faith in Jesus is the only way to be right with God. So what is Paul saying? Well, here's what I think he's saying. A day is coming when the majority of living Jewish people will return to the kingdom of God through faith in Jesus. Paul talked about that there's been a hardening in part. In other words, God has allowed Jewish people, by and large, through this period of history, to have their way. They have turned away from the invitation God extends in Jesus, and God has allowed that while lots of Gentile people, non-Jewish people, come to faith in Jesus. However, because God is faithful to the promise he made Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, God always keeps his word. He hasn't forgotten the Jewish people. We can look forward to a day when the hardening is done, a lot of them have their eyes opened, and they put their faith in Jesus. And you know what? That could be today. That could be in our lifetimes. And so I think that tells us, especially if we have Jewish friends and family members and neighbors, we are to be the messengers who have beautiful feet. Remember, the, the beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. We're to be the messengers who talk with our friends and neighbors and classmates, Jewish or not, about the good news of Jesus. Now, there's this other tricky sentence in verse 32. He says, For God has bound everyone over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. What is that about? He's still talking about, he's still explaining what's going on with the Jewish people. He's reminding us God's overarching goal in all of history is that people will experience his kindness, his mercy. People of every background, regardless of race, God wants them to experience his his kindness. So much does he want this that he has bound all people over to disobedience. Now, what on earth does that mean? here's, Here's what I think it means. God has allowed us to wallow in our unbelief until we recognize just how desperate we are for His grace. This is an image of God allowing us to walk into a prison cell of our own making, a prison of self-centeredness, a prison of self-righteousness, and God saying, let me come in and rescue you. And we've said, no, thank you, stay away. And God says, okay, have it your way. I'm going to close the door until you realize just how badly you need me. Paul's saying uh, that's what's happened with the Jewish people. Really, it's happened with all of us. We've, been, we've, been, we've, lo- we've come into this cell of our own making. God has said, okay, have it your way. And when you realize how badly you need me, I'm right here. I would say it this way. God loves you so much. He will allow you to suffer in the prison of a life without him so that you may ultimately come to know the riches of a life with him. He loves you so much, he will allow you to suffer in a life without him so that you can ultimately come to know the riches of a life with him. I'm going to use a couple of parenting analogies today. So uh, my kids who are in the room, apologies to you. I'll get you some ice cream or something later uh, to try to make it up. But uh, it, those of you who are parents can probably appreciate, you know, when uh, when our kids were a lot younger, not now, but a lot younger, um, oftentimes the late afternoon, early evening would be an especially cranky time. You know, they're tired from school, they're hungry. Uh, and so oftentimes in that last hour before dinner, one of the kids would do something that crossed the boundary, maybe mistreat a sibling or, or you know, disrespect a parent or something else. And um, of course, there was a consequence when they crossed the boundary. And so sometimes that would mean that I would take the child to their room it would be crying and kicking and screaming at that age and say, okay, you're going to stay here until you can settle down, until you can stop. When you're ready to come and apologize, you're welcome to join us. We'll be starting dinner soon. We'd love to have you at dinner with us. Uh, and the kid would say, no, you know, you stay away. And uh, a few minutes later, I'd come back. Hey, we're about to sit down for dinner. I'd love it if you would come and join us, but you do have to stop screaming and you need to apologize and you can come. No, no, leave me alone. 
And, you know, Kim and I knew what, they, what the kid most needed was at the table, food and relationship. As soon as they come and they have some nourishing food in their body and they sit with people who love them, it's all going to get better, right? And yet as long as they stayed in their room and insisted on kicking and screaming, it's not going to happen. And so we would start dinner without them. And I would go back up and say, listen, we've started dinner. We'd love for you to join us. Please come. Eventually there would be a moment where they would realize, hmm, I'm hungry. That food smells really good. And they would come down and they would be like, oh, these people aren't so bad after all. And they would sit down and have dinner and everything would get, get better, see? I think that's, that's kind of what Paul is getting at here. We have said to God, I'll do things my way, thank you very much. And God has said, okay, have it your way. Stay there. And when you realize how badly you need me and how much I love you, I'm ready to rescue you. Some of you are here today keeping God at arm's length. Maybe you came because a spouse or a friend invited you. You don't really want to be here. Listen, I'm glad that you're here. But if that's the case, understand God loves you more than anybody else in this universe loves you. He wants to rescue you. He wants to free you. He wants to make you whole. Allow him to come into your life and do that. God is patiently waiting. And Paul has explained, because God longs to pour out his mercy on all people, a day is coming when he will open the eyes of the majority of living Jewish people so that they will see their need for Jesus and come to him in large numbers. So let us live as if that could be today. Let us live a life that makes people want what we have in Jesus. That's a glimpse of the summit, if you will, what's ahead in the future. Now, Paul has been guiding us through some very heavy, dense matters. His heart's been breaking for his people. Uh, we've benefited from grace in part because they rejected it, and yet many of them will return. And now, Paul exclaims in today's passage, verse 33, Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. Here we come to the second part of today's message, a reason to keep pushing forward. I know some of you have felt, even today, as we've gone through the, the verses so far, certainly in the rest of this series, gosh, Josh, can't we just get to something practical? I mean, you know, three keys to a happy love life, five keys to raising healthy kids, you know, the two steps to financial wholeness. Can't we be more practical enough with this theological stuff? I get it. You know, walking through parts of Scripture like this, if there's not an immediately clear, practical application, it's tough. But here's the reason we keep pushing forward. Getting to know God is like mining for infinite riches. Getting to know God is like digging for gold and constantly finding it. We make time to read our Bibles uh, on a daily basis. We make time to meditate on something in the Bible every day. We make time to go to Bible studies and small groups on a regular basis. And we make time to memorize portions of Scripture. We sit in sermons to unpack the Bible. Uh, we even take notes and reflect on them during the week. We spend time in prayer every day, all because... We want to know God. And as we come to know God more and more, as we experience God personally, we discover it's just like striking gold. Or to use another image, it's like eating a rich feast. Now, some of us don't see it that way. We, we, we've kind of put God in this religion box. We have to, we have to complete the religious checklist. Maybe you were forced to go to uh, religion classes as a kid or Sunday school, and you never got anything out of it. It wasn't fun. And so now God's just this box to check off so that you can go through the rest of your week. But understand, God is not a box. God is a person who we have the privilege of getting to know. And when we get to know Him, it's like discovering riches. Each time we come to know Him in a deeper or fresher way, each time we experience Him, it's like we've struck new gold. It's not that we have to jump through all those hoops, all the things I just described. Uh, it's not that we have to jump through these hoops so that God will accept us and bless us. No, that's the opposite of the gospel, remember? The gospel says that God accepts us not because of anything we've done, but because of Jesus. We get credit for what He's done. It's not about jumping through hoops so God will accept us. No, this is, this is, the, this is the understanding that, that knowing God, experiencing Him is worth the effort, it's worth putting in the time to get to know him when we see how beautiful Jesus is, how beautiful the gospel is, 
the more we discover him, we see that is its own intrinsic reward. It's worth the effort. Two weeks ago, I sat down for lunch uh, with Danny Gift over at the Stony Brook School. I was just starting to study this passage, and she was talking about something she's been through that was exactly what we're going to be talking about today. So I, I convinced her to let me record a bit of it so that you could be encouraged. So let's take a look to what Danny has to say. Well, here at Three Village, everyone is really striving to learn and grow all the time. And what that means is that on Sunday, you're really packing it in in the sermon and filling with a lot of scripture and a lot of material, which is great for people um, who, to help them grow. But I was in a season of life where I was having a desperately hard time focusing. And so I would zone out for a minute. And then when I tuned back in, I felt so completely lost. I felt like I couldn't, I couldn't keep track of it all. And that made me feel anxious and made me feel like I was failing at church. And it just was really hard for me. And so I um, ended up trying to find other churches where maybe the sermon would click better, where I was able to listen a little better. And it ended up being that it was far more my problem with my ability to focus than it was about any specific sermon itself. I discovered about myself that I need my hands to be moving at all times when I'm listening to something. So the two things I found to help with that is one, a fidget is incredibly helpful for me uh, to listen and pay attention and helps with my anxiety, as well as I found doodling and uh, taking notes throughout the sermon uh, really helps me stay on track and focus with every word that you're saying. And ever since coming back here, I felt like I'm really able to listen to every word and grow a lot from every sermon. The biggest thing that I've discovered about uh, myself and my personal faith journey um, has been that my whole goal in reading the Bible and studying, studying the word, spending time with God was actually very self-centered. And that's strongly put, but basically what I mean is I was constantly looking for personal application out of every single verse that I read. So no matter what I was reading, I was looking for, what does it say about um, who, how God sees me? What does it say about what my next step should be, how I should be living my life? And while those are all really valuable things, without knowing who God is, it kind of loses its purpose. It loses the, the why you're doing all of those things. And so I found through reading, um, recently I've been reading Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, which are a little bit dense and a lot harder to read verse by verse in application, um, as well as in church, you've been talking all about who God is and his truths. And I've been finding that there's so much value in just learning about who is God. And since I have shifted my focus to that, instead of myself, I have found that my relationship with God has grown so much. I am in just complete awe every time I read the Bible at his mercy and his grace for me and for his people. And it's given me, it's completely renewed my desire to live for him every single day and live out what he's called us to do. So we'll be distributing some fidgets after the service today. No, I'm kidding. Just joking. Uh, I have some doodlers in my family, so I appreciate the, the value of that. But the thing that really got me was what Danny talked about, you know, we have this desire. That every time we read the Bible, there's this immediate application for what we're doing that day. And sometimes that's not the case. But there is a value in just getting to know God over time. And so we pursue Him. And I want to ask you, are you willing to put in the time to get to know God? He's accepted you already if your faith is in Jesus. But do you want to really know him? Some of us put a lot of time into other things that don't have as much of a payoff. I mean, some of us put a lot of time into learning how to get good at the stock market or uh, getting good at golf or another hobby. And the, the reward of those things is not nearly as great as the riches of knowing God. It is worth putting in the time and effort to discover him more and more. And as we do that, uh, we discover some things about God. What are those things? Well, look at the end of verse 33. Paul says, How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Now, Paul's doing a couple of things here. One, he's acknowledging the mystery of God's ways. God's ways are higher than ours. 
We may, ne- we may not fully understand on this side of heaven why God does things the way that he does, and that's okay. If we know his character, we can trust him even when we don't understand. How do we know he, he can be trusted? Because he gave his son to rescue us. He's trustworthy. But Paul's also exclaiming here about the infinite depths of God's knowledge and wisdom. And he says, Who, who's been God's counselor or God's advisor? In other words, have any of you ever given God advice? Some of us have tried, but did he ask for it? <laughs> did God ever say, hey, you know, how should I design something called the Grand Canyon? Oh, a river. That's a good idea. Yeah, I should use that. Or how should I design a, a snowflake? Did, of course, God didn't ask for your advice. If you think he did ask for your advice, we should talk sometime. God is a bottomless well of wisdom, and that makes us want to explore and dig and search to know God more and more because he satisfies our souls. But you know what? This is also humbling. When we realize how much greater God's knowledge and wisdom are than ours, how deep that well is, it makes us want to come before him in humility. I say that because some of us think we have God all figured out. We've got all of our theological T's crossed and our I's dotted, and there's absolutely no mystery left. And if that's the case, you think you've got God all figured out, you're really flirting with spiritual pride, which is dangerous. We humble ourselves before Him. But look at what else we discover as we get to know God. Verse 35, Paul says, "'Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from Him and through Him and for Him are all things.'" Did God ever come to you and say, hey, I'm out of money. Can you loan me a few dollars? Of course not. He doesn't doesn't have to borrow money. Anything we have is received from God as a gift of grace. Now, you might say, well, I don't even believe in God. That's okay. The air that you used to speak that sentence was a gift from God. Uh, You know, some of you say, well, I believe God's there, but He hasn't really given me anything. I I pulled myself up by the bootstraps. I paid my own way through school. I built my business from the bottom up. That's great. Who gave you the mind to study? You gave you the strength and the health to do your work. Those are gifts that we call common grace. In other words, gifts from God that he gives regardless of what you believe about him. Some of us think, hey, I gave God a really nice offering last week. He owes me some blessings this week, doesn't he? Did you? Where did you get that offering from? Uh, Some of you have kids in elementary school in the area still. Uh, You know about this time of year in December, they do something called the Holiday Boutique at the schools. Anybody know about this? Surely it's not just us. Yeah, a few. Right. Okay. You're in my family. (laughs) All right. I think, yeah, good. Uh, They do something called the the holiday boutique at the elementary schools where we have an outside vendor come in uh, to take over like a a classroom for a couple of weeks and they set up a store uh, filled with lots of inexpensive kinds of trinkets for, for, for holiday gifts uh, so that kids can come and get gifts at school to surprise their family with, you know, on Christmas. Uh, and um, nowadays our, our, our kids do things to earn money so that they can buy presents, which is nice. But when they were younger, they would come to us right before the, the holiday boutique, and they would say, hey, can I have some money for the boutique? And I'm like, hold on, let me get this straight. You want some of my money so you can go buy me a present? <laughs> yes. Okay, great. But even though, it was, even though it was my money that was being used to buy me a present on Christmas morning, I would unwrap something. I didn't know what it was going to be. It might be a a mug that says world's greatest dad or a baseball that says, dad, you're my hero. And you know what? Even though it was my money that went to buy those things, they were really special. Gifts for my kids expressing how they feel about me. I still have those things on my dresser and on my desk, lots of them. And you see, that's really how it is with everything that we have. You may, you may offer God an offering, you may give Him something, but every, anything, anything we give Him was a gift from Him to begin with, wasn't it? It wasn't something that we just accomplished or achieved on our own. God doesn't owe us anything. Here's the point Paul is making. God's generosity undergirds our very lives. Everything you are, everything you have is because God is generous. It's right there in verse 36. From him and through him and for him are all things. God is the author. God is the helper. God's the ultimate beneficiary of everything that we have. The fact that you have breath in your lungs, the fact that you can see the sunset, the fact that you can sit down with loved ones for a holiday meal this week, those are all gifts from a generous God. 
Your food is from him and to be enjoyed for his glory. Your closest relationships are from him and to be enjoyed for his glory. Your ability to help people invest money or learn physics or whatever you do for work. As you do those things, those are gifts from God. And as they bless other people, they glorify him. And especially, especially if you have the assurance that your sins are forgiven, that God's spirit lives in you, that you have the riches of heaven waiting for you, that you have access to almighty God in prayer. If you have those things, they are gifts of sheer grace given by a generous God. God doesn't owe you anything except judgment. And he gave Jesus to take that so you don't even have to worry about that. You see, the more we pursue knowing God, the more we discover that his knowledge and his wisdom are infinitely deep, and the more we discover that he is far more generous than we've ever conceived, the best thing we can do with our lives is to pursue knowing God. And as we do that, we get a radically new perspective for life. This is the final point today. The more we know God, the more we want to direct every part of our lives to his praise, to worshiping God. That's the culmination at the end of the chapter, verse 36. Paul says, to him be the glory forever. Amen. But then go ahead to the first verse of chapter one, because there's no break in Paul's letter. He says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, To offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, this is your true and proper worship. The more we know God, the more we want to offer Him every part of our lives to worship Him. Now, that includes singing songs here like we did this morning. The worship team did a great job leading us, but it goes much beyond that. It involves offering up our whole lives as a living sacrifice. Not a dead animal sacrifice on the altar. It means that we offer God our working life and our school life and our friendship life and our recreational life and our eating and drinking life and our sex life and our secret life. And we say, God, I want this part of my life to honor you. I want every part of my life to honor you. It is from you and through you and for you. You see, when we forget that all those things are from him and for him, we get things disordered, and we start to think that all those things are for us to do whatever we want with however we want. But when we remember it's all from God and through God and for God, we can then orient every part of our lives to bring him praise. I love how the British pastor and scholar John Stott summed up what we're talking about today. He said, it is of great importance that theology, our belief about God, and doxology, our worship of God, should never be separated You could say theology leads to doxology. Now, what is that about? Those are big terms. Well, here's here's what I'm talking about. Some of us say, and I've heard you say this, I don't really need to I don't really need to read the Bible. I like to pray. I like to sing those really cool worship songs. I, I don't need to read the Bible. Okay, that's the case. When you pray, who are you praying to? Who are you who are you singing to? Probably you're singing to the God of your own making, who most likely looks a lot like you. Because the only way that we really know God as he is, is through the Bible, as he reveals himself. We can't separate getting to know God through scripture from worshiping God. But then there's the other side of that coin, because uh, as Stott says, all true worship is a response to the self-revelation of God in Christ and scripture, and arises from our reflection on who he is and what he's done. But you see, there are some of us There are some of us who love our theology and we love our scriptural debates. It's very academic for us, but how has it impacted our lives? Some of the people who most love the theology and the doctrine are the most lifeless when they are singing praise. Have you ever noticed? Or the least pleasant to be around in life. You see, we can't separate the two. And so as as John Stott says, God is not an object for cool, critical, detached, scientific observation and evaluation. No, the true knowledge of God will always lead us to worship as it did Paul. You see, as you study the Bible, as you get to know God, as you apply the gospel to your heart and life, let it move you. Let his love warm your heart. Let it shape you. I want to conclude today by letting you hear one more quick testimony. Bill Munch, come up and join me here. Uh, Bill has been uh, coming to Three Village Church for, I guess, a little over a year with his wife, Robin, and um, 
he really just exudes the, 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 the things that we're talking about. He's experienced life change. And so, Bill, come and share uh, with everyone about what God's done in your life and how this applies. Let me get you a microphone so we can hear you. All right, there you go. Have you ever sat in a sermon and felt like you were the only one in the room? That's today for me. Pastor Josh has been speaking directly to me in a way that I, I don't think I've ever actually experienced before. So thank you. When Pastor Josh first reached out to me, I thought, my testimony is really not that interesting. It's not special, it's not miraculous, it didn't happen in one moment. It happened over a long period of time. And to really capture this, I'm gonna rewind back to childhood. My parents were Catholics, I went to the Catholic Church till I was eight, made my communion. My parents got disenchanted with the church and left, never to return. I wore the Catholic badge way into adulthood. And the truth is, I didn't even know what that meant. I had no relationship with God. I had no relationship with Jesus, and it bugged me. So I'm going to read, a little different than I did in the first service, because I want to stay on, on task here, uh, because I think there's some points in here that are very important that I might have missed earlier. God was always with me. He was whispering to me my entire life. I had so many moments in my life that I shouldn't be alive. I was a boy. I did crazy things into adulthood. I did crazy things. I could tell you many stories of how he saved me. <laughs> I know he did. Mostly physical, stupidity, falling asleep, asleep at the wheel, crashing mountain bikes at very high speed, near choking, drownings, many things where I probably shouldn't be standing here today, but I am. <laughs> Thank God. Fast forward. Um, my wife and I, Robin, sitting right here, were married in 2005, February of 2005, during the only snowstorm of that year. That might have been foreshadowing what was to come. To about three years later, um, we would separate. We'd actually divorce. Our children were young. It was very painful. Fast forward two more years. We're both in committed relationships with other people. Robin, my wife, Eisenstein, maiden name, was raised Jewish, was Jewish at this time. The man she was dating was a Christian. They found themselves in a Christian church, and it was about a year later where my phone rang and said she wanted to put the band back together, the Munch family. I said yes. <laughs> of course I said yes. That led us to church together as a family. And in 2019, we were both baptized. And you notice I don't say I was saved because I don't think I was at that time. I still went to church. I sat here just like you're sitting now, but I was still dead inside. I still didn't know Jesus. And it wasn't until a pastor, much like Pastor Josh, in a similar sermon, many sermons, prodding us to dive into the Bible, to his word, to get to know God. And so my journey began, still not saved. One foot in the world, one foot in Jesus, chasing bigger, better, more things of this world, completely oblivious, still. And one day, I committed to reading the Bible in a year. And I arrive at Matthew 19, 23 and 24. And we've done okay in our lives, financially, Robin and I. And I know how hard it is to fit a camel through the eye of a needle. And I was horrified. And I was horrified because I knew I lived in a world of temptation and judgment and jealousy and all of the sins that I didn't even know they were sins for most of my life 
until I started reading the Bible. And I received some Holy Spirit enlightenment. And honestly, I thought I was going to read this to you today. But this is the second time. He's not letting me. He just wants me to tell you. If you're sitting here right now, empty, and you come here, and you don't have a relationship, I beg you, get in his word. It's life-changing. Praise God. I watched my children. Both of them give their life to Jesus over the last couple of years. It changed their lives. It changed our lives. And together, we're locked arms today in Jesus. And we push each other as a family. And it is, oh, it's amazing. It's amazing. I see a lot of young people, which is why I wanted to try to stay on script today. Don't wait. If you're not there, don't wait. Don't wait. I was in my 50s when I found Jesus. Praise God. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Uh, the reason I asked Bill to, to, to share is because every time I interact with him, and truthfully, anybody in his family, there is this noticeable hunger for God, this desire to know God more and more. And that's what I long for for all of us, that we would say, knowing God is worth it. The more we discover his knowledge and wisdom, the more we discover his generosity, the more we want to know him, and the more we want to offer him our lives in worship. Will you pray with me? Father, we praise you today, just as Paul did, oh, the infinite riches of your knowledge and wisdom. We praise you for your generosity, Lord. We thank you for pursuing us, even while we were dead in our own sin, for unlocking the prison door and bringing us out and giving us freedom and giving us new life. We thank you, Lord. I pray, God, that you will show us what it looks like practically to pursue getting to know you the steps we need to take, and Lord, that you would pour out your spirit on us as we do, that you would give us deep understanding, uh, experience of you as we seek you, Lord. Allow us to find you, and would you be glorified as a result. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We invite you to stand for our final song. God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above you, heavenly host. Praise Father. I 
Thanks for leading us, guys. Great job today. You guys sound good, too. I just want to let you know about a few things coming up here. Um, <clears throat> this Tuesday night, we have our special Thanksgiving service. It's going to be 7 o'clock upstairs in the Commons. This is a really informal uh, service of gratitude. We give you the opportunity, if you want, to share uh, some things you're grateful for, either in front of everybody or with a small group of people. We hang around and have uh, pumpkin and apple pie afterwards and just enjoy being together. So I encourage you, if you're around Tuesday night, make time to be here, 7 o'clock. Uh, we also have our Christmas decorating night coming up this Saturday. We're going to get ready for uh, the Christmas season, decorate the building. That's going to start at 6 o'clock Saturday. We will provide pizza, uh, but it helps if you can let us know you're coming so we have enough pizza. And the way you can do that is Stop by the Activity Center on your way out. Put your name down to let us know uh, that you plan to be here. Today is the deadline to drop off your Operation Christmas Child shoebox. If you've put one of those together, the building should be open until at least 1 o'clock today. So if you forgot to bring it, there will be a few minutes when, you, uh, when we finish here to run, grab it, and come back. But today is the day to drop those off. Last announcement. Uh, we started a special service last December called a blue Christmas service. And the thinking is that, you know, for a lot of people, um, the Christmas season is joyful, it's happy, we're up a lot. Uh, but for a, a good number of people, the holiday season brings with it a lot of extra grief, pain, and heaviness for a number of different reasons. And when it seems like everybody else is up and you're down, 
it, it can be hard to know what to do with that, uh, how to bring that to God during, during this season. And so uh, we're having a blue Christmas service, which is a space to come uh, and to be in God's presence, acknowledging that reality, acknowledging the heaviness of what this season can mean, acknowledging loss. Uh, and processing that before God. So if that applies to you, we invite you to come. It's going to be December the 8th, Sunday evening at 5 p.m. It may not apply to you, but you might know somebody in your life who would really benefit from that. So you would encourage them to be present December 8th at 5 p.m. No sign up is necessary. Uh, Would you please stand for the benediction? College and career lunch happening upstairs in the commons. I've been smelling it since the start of point two in the sermon today. It smells so good. If you're a college or grad student or young adult, feel free uh, to hang around for that as we conclude the service. As we conclude, we acknowledge what all the angels of heaven are acknowledging. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive honor and glory and praise forever and ever. Amen. God bless you. Thank you.